Howdy, my name is Tom Noski and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, a full-service digital agency. If you want to grow with a premium agency and have the ability to work with Jordan directly, then learn more at neural.com slash media and request a callback. That's N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash media. My name is Jordan Michaelides and I'm your host on a show where we dig deep on unique individuals. If you like the show, subscribe. We would love that. It gives us a lot of support and helps us keep things going as well. You can always give us a nice little like, which is always useful. Show notes are down below, just in the comments section. You can also find the link there in the description. It's neural.com slash podcast for all previous episodes. If you want to listen to the audio, if you don't want to be watching it on YouTube, you can find us on all your good podcast apps. That's Uncommon Show. Uh, you'll be able to find us everywhere. If you want to see behind the scenes with us, what we're doing each week, search Uncommon or at Uncommon underscore show uh, on Instagram and you'll find us there. But uh, what can I say? Thank you so much for checking us out and uh, let's get into it. My guest this week is Tom Nosky digital creator, photographer, filmmaker. Um, I actually came through him via my mate Roscoe, but also I remember seeing your episode with Hayden Peterson yes. on his channel as well. But um, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me, mate. I'm excited to be here. This is probably the first time I've been on a podcast that I've actually listened to oh, really? prior to you reaching out to me. <laughs> That's, That's sure. so. F- did, what, what did you, do you remember what you listened so to? So I listened, I first listened to your Mike and Liam podcast ah, okay yeah and then i listened to your sam wood episode because uh one of my mates started working with him at the woodshed did he uh yeah so mike mike uh god how am i forgetting his last name <laughs> do you love that when you do it i always forget names <laughs> when i do interviews yeah like uh, first names always get down pat but like last names is always a thing that i fuck up mm. One of those random things I blank on. Well, you got my last name correct, which is exciting. That's probably one of the <laughs> How first How do most times. people pronounce it? Uh, so they think the E is silent, so it's Nosk or Nosk, and then, yeah, Nosk or Nosk, mostly. No scope. Yeah. <laughs> That's so fucking funny. You know, I, yeah. was, I was looking at, um, like, icebreakers to start. Mm. A lot of the guys have asked them about their photographer name. Mm. Uh, then I was thinking maybe we should chat about the BGS rowing video. <laughs> But then Hayden Peterson messaged our uh, podcast, oh, of course he did. <laughs> our podcast Here um, we go. <laughs> Instagram, and he said something about stash. The stash, yeah. So what is the stash? The stash is my dirty, dirty mustache that I grow every couple of months. Okay. Yeah. So I just, I don't know. I have a, I have a, I have a tendency to, to love to change the way I look. It's why I like things like tattoos and stuff like that. And every few months. I'll grow up my beard and then I'll shave the beard and leave the mustache and it looks horrible, but I love it. <laughs> and then I'll leave that for a few months and then go back to being clean shaven. I just have a tendency to yeah. show every single time I hang out with Hayden, I look different, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting because Hayden's the kind of guy that looks the same every single day. So I think he that's, does, doesn't he? that's a contrasty thing between the two of us. I just, I, every single time you see me, I've probably grown my beard, shaved my beard, cut my hair, got a new tattoo, something like that. Like, there's always something different about me. Hayden's definitely got like a, like a Steve Jobsian sort of um, outfit. He's got, a, he's got a clean cut look going yeah. on. Black cap. <laughs> like occasionally they've they've had behind the scenes sort of stories, and I'll be like, whoa, a wild Hayden with hair appears. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> he's always clean shaven. He's always wearing a plain t-shirt, yeah. and uh, like the same chinos or jeans. Yeah, I mean, it, it works. It works for him. Yeah. I think I like, I have thought about this many times just completely getting rid of everything in my wardrobe and switching it out for plain t-shirts plain jeans and just buying a million pairs of each because <laughs> it's just so much easier it's like i am so lazy with dressing myself yeah. that i it almost feels easier to just commit to one thing i agree i think when you've got a lot of things going on as well it just it, it, it's one less thing to one think less about. thing to decide about like mm. I, I definitely have um go-to shirts and sh- like i'm pretty sure most the chinos are this color from Uniqlo, and then I've got like maybe an olive. I like the new boots as well. Yeah, the first pair of RM Williams. Very, I don't know very if the nice. Audience, audience, they're brand spanking pr- new. They're very nice. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, first time I've ever born proper, uh, bought proper boots. <laughs> <laughs> born yeah. boots. Um, yeah, it feels good. There's a few of those adult purchases, aren't there? Yeah, things there's like a, a few watch, things like that. Like a nice jacket, your first suit, pair yeah. of boots. There's a few things like that that like, I'm a real adult now. Yeah, I'm a you, real you, man. That's, <laughs> when you, that's when you feel like you've actually got some savings behind you and you can actually go and buy that sort of thing. Yeah. But I'm only feeling that now at like 29, so. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't worry. I haven't quite bought my first pair of R- RM Williams, but I'm thinking I've been on the look for a nice watch. I'm not, yeah. I'm really not a, like, I'm the type of person that gets made fun of because I wear the same thing every single day to parties and stuff like that. Like, I'll show up in this, either these or jeans and maybe a different coloured shirt every single time. But there's something about a really nice watch or a really nice pair of boots that just draws me in. It's the only two things. Yeah, yeah. And maybe, like, down the line, maybe a nice car. But a nice watch and a nice pair of boots, and I don't know what it is. It's not like a... I don't want a Rolex. I don't want a name yeah. brand thing. I don't want to. I don't even, don't even want a pair of Arrow and Williams. I just want a nice pair of boots and a nice watch. It's just like <laughs> one of those things. I think. I think I'm. I think I'm close to buying. I think that it's nice the watch. Um, the signalling of the craftsmanship and and understanding what it's about. Like I didn't realise until I started looking into Arrow and Williams how much effort mm. goes into making a pair of boots, and the watch thing as well. Like you don't even have to buy. Um, a crazy watch to find a really high caliber. Well, I think the 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 humanness that goes into making a watch, yeah, well, like a, so. a, a a watch that is not mass made by a ETA manufacturer in Switzerland, like something that is made mm. by a team of people, is really really cool. There's actually um, I don't know, you've probably heard of the Fifth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we we interviewed Alex McBride, and they just came up with their own Swiss watch. Mm. Um, but his is really interesting because they bring, they, they've gone for that range that is not cheap $100 watches and not expensive $2,000 watches, but in the middle. Mm. And it sort of fits both molds where you've got value for money, but also you're getting some level of craftsmanship that goes into it. Mm. I think it's also, the, it's one of the few things that you can buy as a bloke that is timeless. Yeah. Like you don't buy a watch to replace it two years later. You buy yeah. a watch to... You know, if you buy an expensive watch, it's the kind of thing you want to give to your son. Yeah. Or it's the kind of thing that you want to pass on. Or it's just the kind of thing that you go like, this is going to be my watch for the next 20 years. Yeah. Uh, which I don't think you get many of as a bloke. There's not no. many things that you buy. Like, girls have their, their jewelry. Like, the handbags. my mum has her jewelry case that is gone from every single house. She has, a, I think, yeah, the handbag she has now is the same handbag my dad bought her as a wedding gift. Really? Which is remarkable that was like 24 years ago now or something like that so it's it's like things like that are very common as a girl but as a guy there's not many things that you buy and you're like this is mine for life yeah which i think well this this thing um is a maurice lacroix watch given to me by my dad it's not crazy expensive it's not a top tier watch it's a smaller maker from Mm. the french part of switzerland Mm. Um, but because it was given to me on my 21st, it's saying that I'll have forever yeah. and ideally hand down to someone else. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love that shit. Like, I mean, all my the jackets that I get made, this is one of the only things I get made, has yeah. got, like, my initials monogrammed into oh, the cool. thing because yeah. I'm just like, yeah, this will be hand down yeah. someday at some point. But that's mainly because my, my grandpa used to have buy, like, crazy suits and like mm. wear them to the beach and stuff like that so there's a bit of like that a element bit of, of nostalgia there. that yeah, yeah. I, I just shot a wedding two weeks ago now uh and one of the speeches that the dad gave was this story about how his son when he was like four or five years old grabbed his nice uh gold plated flexi it was a really really nice watch uh i can't remember what brand it was but he had play he, he gave it to his son at like a race day because they were they breed purebreds and they were at a uh-huh. race day and it was like take this entertain yourself blah 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 and he come back, came back to him at the end of the day and the watch was gone and like another two weeks later when they were leaving the, they found the same cab driver that they thought they lost the watch in the cab driver had the watch gave it back to him it was this cool story and at the end of the speech he gave the watch to his son as a wedding gift and it was like I'd never met these people but it had me in tears like, wow. filming the thing I was like this is this is so cool and stories like that are are really really cool. Do you what sort of your own memory or earliest memory of your childhood? <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought you were going to ask this question. My 
oldest memory of my childhood, and can I swear? On yeah, this you podcast? can swear. You want. So I have an older brother who is he's my stepbrother, but you know, for the sake of saying it, he's my brother. Um, he's now in his forties, but he. I remember we were at a Christmas party or or some sort of party, and I was like on the couch with him, and he was telling me how to say shit and fuck. <laughs> Um, <laughs> How old was he at the time? I think he would have been in his 20s and I would have been... Young. Yeah, very young. I think I was yeah. four or five at the time. Okay. And Sounds like a good brother. I remember we, like, the room was... I don't remember it exactly, but I remember it was a really, really still moment in the room. Everyone went quiet and I just, at the top of my lungs, went, shit. And my <laughs> mum freaked out. The room started laughing and, yeah, it was just... That was probably my first... That's the first thing that comes to mind when I think of my That's childhood. That's fucking gold. Yeah. Do you know, like, Lauren, when she was growing up, um, the, her mum told us this story recently where she, her mum was driving in the car. Yeah. And uh, it was just totally the same thing, dead silent. And then all of a sudden Lauren just goes, fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> 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 because apparently yeah. her mum, when driving, would just swear at people, like yeah. incessant yeah. road rage. Well, that's, yeah, you can't blame an older brother for that one. No, you definitely <laughs> can't. Do you think there's like a a lesson that, I don't know what your parents did when when you were growing up, but is there any like principles or lessons that you have from them? From my parents? Yeah. Um, my, my parents are both. Uh, from big country families. So my mum was from Warrnambool. Well, both my parents oh, are from yeah. Warrnambool or Portland, more specifically. Um, Great area around there. <laughs> yeah, it's a quiet area, but a good Very area. Very quiet. Um, yeah, and it's an, so they're both from there, and my dad's one of five and my mum's one of nine. Um, so I think... Because my parents. Yeah, so I think a, like a, a work ethic is probably the one thing that my parents taught me. My old man is is someone that has, he's been very successful, he's had failures, he's had everything in between. He started when he was very young. Um, he's always been an entrepreneur in the sense that I think he told me that he's had a boss for a total of two weeks in his entire life and his <laughs> last conversation with him was to tell him to get fucked. <laughs> so he's just, he's very much like me in the sense that I can't be told what to do. And I think he, like most parents in that situation where they can't be told what to do, might go down the path of telling someone what to do. But he he respected that in me from a very early age to the sense where he would never, ever pressure me to do something, mm. but he would always let me know if I was doing a good job or let me know if I was fucking up. Yeah. So it was like a, it was a, it was kind of like a hands-off-ish relationship that we had, but it was mutual respect, which I think was very, very cool from a very early age. And then... Um, yeah, just a work ethic they taught me, and also just a like a, a a blind confidence in what I'm doing. I think there was always a little bit of a push, like from the day I turned 18 or the day I finished school. It was always like, okay, let's go, come on, <laughs> let's uh, let's move out of the nest, let's see what we're doing. Like, and I think from you know there was trust at an early age when I did things like sport and that sort of thing, and then I had to regain that trust in my late teens and early 20s but once I regained that trust it came back to that blind confidence again yeah. which I think is is cool so just a it's it's awesome to have someone there that you know you can go to if you screw up or you know you can go to if you need something or you know you can go to for advice or whatever but that also trusts you and is just going to let you do your thing yeah and it's going to let you make the mistakes like which I think is really really cool but yeah they come from big families so it's and I come from a big family as well. So really, how many siblings you got? So I got four. Okay, four siblings. So pretty it's, decent. Yeah, yeah. Not not huge, but not not small. Yeah, it's definitely not. I mean, f so you're one of four, or you have four other siblings. I'm one of four. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, and we're all extremely different. It's like <laughs> I, I, yeah, like I, my closest brother, um, is the kind of guy that you know I'm never going to be worried about him because he's a relentless, he just has a relentless work ethic and he is the type of person that will make 30 bucks an hour but he'll work 150 hours a week. Like yeah. he'll work a ridiculous amount of hours or not 150, that's not possible, but he'll work 100 hours a week making 30 bucks an hour and make good money. So I'm never going to be worried about him. Um, and then my younger brother as well is more similar to me but I just think he's, you know, he's younger. He's yeah. 18, he's going through a, learning what he actually wants to do and then my little sister is smarter than all of us <laughs> she's probably going to be a CEO or whatever of some 
whatever. Like she's just a lot smarter than all of us. Do you, what did your parents do for work? So my mum uh, stopped working when she had after me or after Jackson, but. She, she just worked as an accountant, worked as a bartender, just did a bunch of other jobs. And then my dad uh, ran a logistics company doing transport for uh, wood chip, wind farms, that sort of thing. Wow. And then before that, he was, a, uh, he was one of the founding members and, and was a, a driver and a team owner for uh, Viet Supercars. Oh, and really? so was my older brother. So my old, older brother was a driver until about maybe 10 years ago now. He retired. Wow. Um, yeah, so they, yeah, it's, <laughs> my dad and my older brother lived many, many lives, which is cool. Wow. Yeah. Where, where, what was the team called? So he, he owned the, it was just Tony Noski Motorsport, uh-huh. um, but he raced in the In Excess team. I can probably send you some photos that you yeah, can, I'll go, I'll you go can have splice a look. over, but yeah. he raced in the In Excess team. He raced, my younger brother raced in the Young Lions team. Yeah. So he raced with uh, Greg Murphy, Craig Lowndes, uh, and Garth Tander. Uh, he raced for a bunch of other teams, and then he did the endurance stuff. So he only came in as the co-driver for the endurance teams for his last few years. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think he ever won a race, but I think he finished, I think his best Bathurst was third. Right. I think, I think. I'm not really sure. Do you, would you guys say that you're a car family? Definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. We, I think my dad, he, it's very, very political. Very, very political. At least Australian motorsport is. Really? Massively political. It's, I, from what I have been told by my brother and, and my dad, it's like there's not many people making any money from it yeah there'd be there's, none it, there's, it's too expensive to do so that's the first thing it comes it's wealthy families that race it's not really anyone making money which is why my brother did the enduros because those are the only drivers that make money is the co-drivers that come in for the teams because they get paid hourly or get paid per race rather than wow. having to have a contribution to the team um, but he just my dad never besides a little bit of a push early on to do go-karting there was never any encouragement to do motorsport he'd never wanted us anywhere near motorsport because really? i think he just he, he probably realized how yeah, crazy he, it is. he he had a good he had a good experience with it but also got burnt pretty badly by it so it's just a case where he was like no let's forget that side of my life but he when when we were young he went through his midlife crisis when i was i think before i was born so he's had harleys he's had sports cars, he's had all that sort of stuff. So I think he sort of got it out of his system before I grew up. Do you have a dream car? I do all? have a dream car. It is the HSV GTSR, <laughs> which is the Holden, uh, okay. the, the beefiest Holden you can buy. And then it's funny because I have, I have my worst for the planet dream car and then I also want to buy a Tesla at some point. Yeah, I, don't, is, I feel like everyone wants a Tesla. Like I know that Hayden wants one. I definitely want one, but I saw a funny gif the other day on reddit mm. um someone it was under the uh subreddit well that sucks mm. and it was the line of teslas i think somewhere between california and it might have been like arizona mm. and there was a four hour waiting to charge to charge yeah so because they've got an issue with charges over there because yeah. so many we people now have, we don't have any over here we have no we're, we're there's few sessions. and far between like i think um there's one charger between sydney yeah, I, I stumbled. No, there's, there's one on the Great Ocean Road as well. I accidentally stumbled across it driving there over the last couple of days. Yeah. It was funny. I was on my maps and I was searching up petrol stations and Tesla charging station came up and I was like, what? <laughs> Where is it? Which part uh, of it? So it was out near Apollo Bay. It was right near Apollo oh, wow. Bay, which is a random spot for a Tesla That's charging. fucking far, man. Yeah, well, I, That's I, like, I would assume it's probably they wanted it to be between Melbourne and Adelaide. So yeah. they probably got one between every... Major driving city, yeah. State, um, but yeah, I don't know why. It's funny. I like. I'm genuinely tempted to put a deposit down for the ah, cyber track. Of course, because, <laughs> because I, my it's so, thought, it's so little. Yeah, my thought. <laughs> it's so little, and then my thought is, it's not going to come out as much as he, everyone's like. Oh, it's 2021. Blah. blah. It's not going to come out in 2021. No, it'll be like 2023. It'll be 2022, 2023. So my thought is, okay, we can put a deposit down. I'll be on the list of like 300,000 or whatever it is now. So I'm probably not even going to get it a year after it comes out. Um, and hopefully by the time, you know, that's what, five or six years from now, hopefully by then I'll have enough money to pay money to sort of at least be able to afford it. 
and make that decision then. But if I wait until I have to make that decision, then I won't be on the waiting list and I won't be able to get it anyway. Yeah. So my thought right now is like, well, fuck it, it's hundred bucks. It's it's really like he does this really well. That raising of capital. Well, it's is just so crowd. Smart. It's just crowdfunding. Yeah. That's all it is. Everyone's like, oh, it's, you know, it's bullshit that they let you buy one before, or let you put a deposit before it's even released. It's like, well. All the other companies just ask you for money. At least they're offering something. Yeah. It's <laughs> like there's there's companies out there that are just like, we want to make this, put money into it to maybe have it one day. Whereas yeah. like That's so funny. Tesla Tesla actually be like, This is the product we're gonna release. Do you wanna get on a waiting list? Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah, a lot of Kickstarters never actually result in anything. That's the well, they funniest just never thing. offer anything for your contribution. One of my favorite um, channels on YouTube is people like documenting what happens on Kickstarters. Mm. Like you know, they have this big whiz bang launch, and there's agencies that specialize in it. I remember yeah. Alex McBride told me about that because they were going to do their Swiss watch as a Kickstarter. First off, it's really disappointing because there's such a stigma around, like. Like I, I, I like talking about wanting to shoot a, a couple of documentaries next year. I would love to crowdfund them mm. at least in the beginning um, to sort of allow me to focus more of my attention on it. It would be almost stupid of me not to do that, and then allow some kind of benefit to you know maybe you get previews, maybe you get to join the screening, yeah, free ticket to the screening, whatever. Um, but there's such a stigma around that, especially as an artist that it, it almost feels like, oh, it's not going to work anyway because everyone's going to be like, Tom, you're just selling out, blah, blah, blah. Like, you could always you test it. I think there's something to that. I wonder, you know, like when you have an audience like you guys do, like let's say mm. you've got 50,000 people on Instagram and 1% of that audience chips in 50 bucks, mm. that is still something that goes towards producing. Exactly, and it's, like, it, it's so funny because this idea of being a starving artist is so tied into everything that causes it mm-hmm. like there's so many there's such a stigma around artists making money which i hate i, I, I just hate it. i think that um creatives are just not good at asking they're not good at asking for money they're, for not money. Good at, they're not good at talking about money they're not good at you know they're not good at anything in regards to money because there is such a horrible stigma around Doing it. I think it's such an important conversation because there are so many people that, like, I won't get into specifics, I won't get into names, but there are so many people that are portraying this idea of what they're doing and then they're living a completely different life on social media and making it seem as though they're making this money. And then there's people that watch that and they're like, well, how, how the hell am I supposed to make yeah, money? Yeah. I, how to, like, I don't know how to do this. Like, And it would just take <laughs> one person coming out and being like, look, this is my story. This is how I make my money. This is what I do. This is how you can do it. And then all of a sudden that's cleared up and everyone else can start to, you know, develop in that sense. And I think there's also a problem with young people in general. It's like you need to develop, and you probably talked about it right before we started, the idea of saving money. Mm. You're not necessarily saving money for... If I stay, if I put money away now for me, I'm not putting money away for... 2019 Tom I'm putting money away for 2025 Tom or 2035 Tom or 2045 Tom like and I think that's so important as a young person realizing that yes you might be still living at home yes you might have this awesome job that allows you to go out partying on the weekends or yes you might have this allowance from your parents that feels like it's limitless and you're not ever going to run out but you should always be considering your future and if that means squeezing the lemon yeah if that means you know, things like crowdfunding. If that means something like Patreon, if you've got an audience, or if that means selling a product that you're proud of, don't let someone sitting on the other end of it go, fuck you, you're selling out. Yeah, like, well, most of the time they're not, like, even cr- they're not even doing anything anyway. Yeah. That's exactly. what I find really funny about all that. Most of the time the people who complain, they're consuming your shit for free. I feel like Lewis Spears says that, says this really well. Like, like he's like, oh, for free. Um, if you're complaining about this, uh, fuck you, it's free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which I really, really exactly. like. It's the same with um, Gary Vee. It's like all the people complaining about the algorithms and whatnot. It's like, it's free. Yeah, it's all it's all <laughs> free. And I, I, with the savings thing, I don't think people really realise like the power 
Not many people understand the law of compounding and how a dollar mm. today is worth, if you invested correctly or put down correctly, is worth a lot more in 10 years from now and actually mm. that it's way more valuable at a younger age because mm. that money over time compounds more and more and more because time is what you need. Like most wealthy people are just old. Yeah. That's the one yeah. thing that young people forget. They're like, oh, this, you know, it's so hard to be rich and hard to build money and blah, blah, blah. Well, well, yeah, because like most people who are wealthy are like 50 or 60 you years of time. age. They have spent their entire life building up a nest egg or a, a type of income that allows them to do that. And I feel like that's often forgotten. It also gives you such confidence to do things. Like I realised in the last sort of two years, I think, my I was like everyone else. I got a job straight out of school that was really well paying, and and it's so funny. I was such a, I had such a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> finishing school that the only thing I cared about I was like I'm going to make money finishing school I was like so I, and in some some cases I did but I just burnt through that like it was nobody's business and didn't save a dollar um, but in the last two years I've, I've realised that it gives you such a confidence having a little bit of savings yeah. like even for I was watching one of and it's a common it's not Matt Diavella's thing but I was watching Matt Diavella's episode on financial freedom um, and he talked about the idea of saving uh, like an emergency fund and then a, another emergency fund that is a certain number of months of your expenses. And I immediately after watching that put $1,000 in an envelope and hit it somewhere. Yeah. And that doesn't get spent unless I Something absolutely comes need up. it. Yeah. Something. And just $1,000, which isn't, that's less than one month's rent. But just having that there in cash, if I need it, is such a confidence booster. I, I think that that is so important. Like I've, I got into this stuff when I like got straight out of school to studying finance and all that I sort of I stuff. I wish I did. I wish um, I did. So I've had like a um, emergency fund for probably six years now. Mm. It's not massive. Like it's it's two grand, and considering the expenses that I have on a monthly basis, it wouldn't it wouldn't cover all of it. But it it gives you a buffer for those moments where. All of a sudden, you've got to go get uh, an operation, yeah. Or uh, someone you know gets sick, or all of a sudden you're in some sort of accident and you have mm. to pay for insurance or whatever it is. Mm. You just never know what's going to come up. And then also with the savings thing, it's amazing to see that grow over time and the confidence that gives you. Yeah. Because once you start to see numbers that you never thought that you could save, you you don't even like. I don't know how to explain it. It's like you, you start distancing yourself more and more from it and so you don't pay attention to it. It mm, just becomes mm, automatic mm. And, and it gives you confidence to know, well, if I got fired tomorrow if I got, or if this happened, I would, ha I would actually have this money even though I'm not meant to touch it. Mm. If, if the worst, you know, like I couldn't move in with my parents or mm. this happened or mm. whatever, I'd still have that there and I'd still be safe and I'd still be yeah. okay. It's I also, feel like that's often forgotten. It's also switching that perspective of, of going from um, viewing saving as a task that you have to do. It's like, I remember when I was younger, it's like saving money was like, why would I save money if I can spend that money to live better right now? Yeah. It's like, that doesn't make sense at all. Whereas now saving money to me is spending money on my future. Mm. I'm spending that money on me. Yeah. It's, and that has been such a massive, because like you said, it's like, I have it set up so it's recurring, it's automatic, it doesn't, I don't even see that money. Um, and yeah, you forget about it. Yeah, yeah and you, you look actually back, do, um, yeah. You know, six months later, 12 months later, and you're like, ah, oh, that's wow. pretty cool. Yeah. All right, let's see you later. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's quite amazing. And, and I, the thing that changed it for me was treating it like an expense. Mm. So I don't even see it as savings. It's like this is a monthly expense I have to pay. I, I, I'm looking at your Tony Robbins book. And, <laughs> uh, and the thing that he says or the story that he tells is the 15% the tax story. Yeah, yeah. And it's like uh, if the government tomorrow decided that there's an extra 15% tax on everyone, you would cry and you would whinge and you would argue and you'd be like, fuck the government, like this sucks. But you would have to do it. Yeah. It's like, so why don't you just put a 15% tax on you yeah. and that money is yours still, but it's your savings. Yeah. It's like like 15%, like for example, if I was saving 15% year over year from the day I finished school to now, that would have been amazing. That would have been <laughs> bloody amazing. And it's not even that much in the grand scheme of things. 15%, yeah. if you think about, you know, 15% of what you spend on a daily 
budget and then 15% of what you spend on a weekly and a monthly. Sure, if you go at the end of the year and you're like, how was I supposed to spend, save 15% of, say, if you're 22, you're probably earning between 30 and 50. Like 15% of 30 and 50 grand, that's pretty intimidating. Yeah. But if you take 15% of what you're earning monthly, that's just over your GST. So if you're a business owner, that's essentially yeah. just counted as extra GST. But it, be- but it becomes part of your lifestyle anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, and your lifestyle adapts. Yeah, it's like, like, we're, like prime example. Th- so we have this thing every month, Lauren and I. So we do our budget and then mm. everything gets put in and it gets automatically transferred when our salaries come in, mm. right? And so then we have in on this debit card, we know, okay, this is how much I can spend for the month. I've spent massively this month. I have $400 to last me until the until I get paid next, which is probably around like the twenty seventh or something like Don't that. Don't worry, yeah. Me me too. So the yeah. Boxing Day sales usually people hit the Boxing Day sales, the Boxing Day sales hit me. <laughs> well I, I just know I know that for the next Sorry, Black three, Friday sales. Three yeah, Black yeah. Friday. For the next three weeks I am it's only groceries, there's no going out like if we go out, I'm eating beforehand and we'll drink there or something like that. Like, <laughs> but that's what you have to do, right? You have to, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. otherwise you're just like, ah, credit card. Yeah, and the, you know, I still use the credit card for points and we get a lot of points. That's, but, oh, my but, God, I'm um, so annoyed I didn't get a credit card when I had a job. Yeah. Because I can't – I've only been in business uh, two financial years and I need a third to get a credit card, which is so annoying. It's ridiculous. So you ha- how many years? So you need at least, so they need your last, uh, I think it's, they need your last statement plus two years before that to yeah. even consider you for most banks. Yeah. And then that doesn't even count the high-end credit cards. You've like, got to look at Amex, man. I need to because for all the ones that I've looked at, like I don't even want a crazy credit card. I was looking at one that was like a six grand spending limit with NAB, yeah. which is like it's a overkill. very low tier. Yeah. And they were like, they turned me down purely because I hadn't had three full financial years as a business owner. Yeah. Which I think is, and it's so annoying because I'm learning all this stuff about, you know, points and and if it was just like purely off my expenses this year, I would probably be able to fly around the world a couple of times next yeah, well, year. Do you know what's amazing is with all those Pretty bonuses cool. and that, Lauren and I will be able to fly Dubai return for a honeymoon mm. uh, first class. You lucky bastards. Yeah, but you can do that yeah, like really, yeah. really well. We're not spending massive amounts of money. But the thing that shoots me with the business credit cards is what actually happens when you're a younger business, they, they end up putting you as the principal on, mm. the, on the credit card. So it's technically not given to the business but actually you, Yeah, which I fucking hate. But yeah. um, I reckon you got to look at it because Amex have been amazing for us and the bonuses they have are Remind amazing. Remind me of that after the podcast. I'll, I'll, do, I'll show you the card that yeah. you should probably look at because not only that, they have like zero fees in comparison most of the time yeah. to NAB. Cause um, my, yeah, because my idea with a credit card is I'm just going to use it for all my business expenses and transfer the money immediately. Yeah. I'm not going to change any of my spending. I'm not going to start spending money that's, I don't that's have. That's what we do. But yeah, just everything. Like for I've example, not paid interest yeah. on a credit card Probably ever. The only time I have yeah. was when we came back from a trip in Europe and I mm. really needed to spend the money. I'd run it, run out of money mm. and I'd had to pay it off over a two-month period mm. and we got charged. In, but it was like $40 a month. <laughs> so I, I could bear that cost mm. knowing that I was eating like ramen noodles in Europe and that actually I needed to be eating proper food and stuff like mm. that. So you can definitely do it, man. You yeah, can no, definitely I, do it. And yeah. the, the bonuses in that, are, you travel a lot, it seems, yeah, or regularly not, enough. Not, yeah, regularly enough. I think next year is going to be a much bigger year for travel, which is why I need to figure that out Yeah, uh, as soon as possible. I'm very fortunate that a lot of the time the travel is uh, not my money. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's there's just been so many circumstances where I'm like, God damn it, like, why am I not able to have a credit card that could have given me the points back to... To do this sort of thing. Yeah, so. you uh, back on the point of starving artists. I know that um, you had done art at high school, mm. and then you went down the area of PT probably because mm. you loved sport. It sounded like when we were chatting mm. before that sport is a thing that you really, really enjoy. Yeah, it's a it's just part of where I grew up and who I grew up with. I think. Like my, my, my younger brother or my closest brother, so Jackson, who's 18 months younger than me, um, all, like, all through growing up, I was quite a 
quite a pudgy kid. <laughs> I was a little bit, I, I didn't grow until I was maybe in year eight or year nine. Okay. Um, so I was like five, five and 70 odd kilos then. And I was just a little bit, you know, I wasn't fat, but I was just a little bit pudgier than my other. And my brother was very lean, very athletic, very talented in sport. And I always looked at him probably from like age nine till 15. He was the one that I looked at and was like, I want to be like him. Um, which is interesting. There's not many circumstances where you look no. at a younger brother that way. It was looked at through the lens of, fuck you, but like I always was saying fuck you because I was jealous of his talent. Um, and I sort of realised that, um, you know, he made the, I think the first time I realised it was he made the, the national team or the state team for swimming. And I just decided in that moment, I was like, nah, I've had enough. I've had enough of this shit. I'm going and I'm joining swimming and I'm going to make the national team or I'm going to make the state team. And it happened. A few years later, it happened. And at like 12 or 13 years old, Jackson and I were very, very competitive swimmers. And, and from that, it then stemmed into cricket. So Jackson was a very, very talented fast bowler when we were younger. Um, and I just decided I went from a kid who could barely play cricket to I think in the last one of the last seasons that I ever played cricket. Jackson and I opened the bowling from either end, which is a pretty cool experience. <laughs> and then just from that, it sort of steamrolled into, I didn't really realise it when I was younger, but I kind of gained a confidence to back myself. Like I, I realised pretty early on that the only thing standing between me and what I wanted to do was just working twice as hard as everyone else. Mm. And I think I learned that from Jackson because I realised very early on that for me to be like Jackson... I had to work twice as hard as Jackson. Um, and that led into like football, for example. I was, I remember being, and I actually remember this thought. I remember being on the football field at like 12 years old or nine years old or that under 12s, under 10 sort of level. And I remember being like, fuck me, I'm terrible at this shit. Like I'm so bad at football. Like why am I so much worse than every kid on the field? And I remember when I first grew, like I first went, I went from like 5'5 five, five to like six foot three where I am now uh, in, and I remember, I remember having this size foot in like year six. <laughs> so I remember being like, I'm going to grow one day. I'm going to grow. Um, and I finally grew in like year eight and I ran out in the football field for like the eight Bs or something. And I was playing in the ruck and I was like six, three and like 74 kilos. So I was very, wow. very little. Um, and I just got whacked, like absolutely did not punch, but I just got dominated by the other ruckman. And I got off the field and, and the, the cog started turning. I was like, all right, what do I have to do here? What do I have to do? And I was like, all right, I'm going to put on weight. I'm going to get bigger. I'm going to get stronger. And that's how I met Roscoe. As I went to the gym, I literally called it the first gym I could find. Uh -huh. Went to the gym. I was like, I'm going to get bigger. Um, and then I ended up being in my last year of school, still a terrible footballer, still couldn't kick, still couldn't mark, still couldn't handball. But I ended up being, the only reason I was picked was because I was the biggest kid on the field. I was, I was six, whatever I am now, six, three, six, two and 96 kilos I'm, I'm like nowhere near that now but I was a much bigger kid in high school and so that sort of like that that idea that chip on my shoulder of I have to work twice as hard as everyone else to achieve what everyone else doesn't sort of carried it, it collided with art because my entire life I've always been a good artist mm -hmm. I remember very early on my entire family like my extended family my parents my brothers my sisters Everyone told me, you need to be an artist. Like, this is something you're very, very good at. You're going to use this one day. And in the back of my mind, I was always like, nah, how am I going to make money painting? How am I going to mm. make money drawing? And, and I realized that. And then I remember watching one of Peter McKinnon's videos when he, like 2016, watching one of his videos. Jesus. Yeah, very early on. Um, and I was a personal trainer at the time. And... I wasn't loving personal training. It was kind of, it was really, really good for me. I loved the people aspect. I loved learning and I loved talking to people. But I remember watching that video and being like, damn, this guy's a really successful artist. It's like, I can do this. And that was the first time that my intrinsic talent matched my work ethic. And I sort of approached that with the same sense of, I'm going to have to work twice as hard as everyone else. Uh -huh. with that chip on my shoulder. But it, it was the first time it ever just clicked straight away. It's funny that you mentioned Peter McKinnon because now I realise why you were shooting on the 1DS. Now the 1DS, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. For a wedding and I was yeah. like, um, oh, I would have thought he'd be like a Sony guy. Mm -mm. Um, mm -mm. And yeah, Peter McKinnon is a big Canon guy, yeah. right? I don't actually know. Does he use the 1DS still? Mm -mm. I think he uses a I red. Think he, uses, he has a, 
yeah, he has a red now and he uses the EOS R for his vlog sort of stuff. That's right, because I was sussing out, because we're buying this camera rig in the new year, do we get the EOS R? Hold or out. Do we, Hold or, out. Or do we a, get... There's a professional one coming. So well, there's... okay, so he, here's an interesting thing for camera geeks that are listening. Uh, Panasonic just came out with the new... Um, it's the, the 6K... Um, not predecessor, the successor to the GH5. Mm. Um, I think it's called the S1. Yes, I've seen that one. Yes. Yeah. Fuck, it's amazing. It's I would, amazing. I would. Shoot 6K. The sensor is better than the new A7 Mark IV. I don't I know would, if that's an R4 yeah. or if it's a normal 4. Anyway, but so you're sa- what are you saying? What do you, what do you I would highly come? recommend just holding your guns and mm-hmm. relaxing until about March. Okay. Because Canon... I think from what I've heard from people at Canon, what I've heard from rumors is their, you know, they have put a lot of money into their uh, RF range of lenses. And the EOS R is not a professional camera. It's not anywhere near what Canon's capable of. So there's rumors that the EOS RS is going to be coming out in March, Mm. which is going to be a 1DX competitor, mirrorless competitor. Damn. But they're also releasing the 1DX Mark III around, I think it's around then. So Right. 1DS isn't mirrorless. No. So it's the 1DX Mark III is going to be a hybrid. So it's going to be a hybrid of a mirrorless. Essentially, when you're looking through the viewfinder, it's a mirrorless. Uh, sorry, it's a mirrored camera, DSLR. And then when you're looking through the live view, it's a mirrorless camera. Yeah. So it's going to have uh, eye tracking IS and all, uh, eye tracking uh, auto a- AF and all that sort of stuff that comes with a mirrorless option, but then it's also going to be a DSLR. Yeah, and this is the big thing that's happened in this industry recently that I don't think a lot of people who who aren't into tech realise is how much things have been analogue like mm. and moving towards digital. Like the um, the packs that we're using now, the Sennheiser packs, mm. like they are fully 100% digital mm. packs, but the industry for years has always had an- analogue packs where you have to actually put in the frequency that you want to broadcast on mm. to your to your wireless little input. Mm. Same thing with sort of the cameras. They're all going towards this sort of mirrorless, mm. like 100, not 100, I wouldn't call it 100% digital, but they're not, they're not using a mirror, yeah. uh, hence mirrorless, yeah. which is a change in the technology. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it is the future, and I would be stupid to sit here and say that DSLRs are the, the best option. I just, I don't know, I, every time I shoot on a Sony, uh, like a friend Sony or, or whatever, I'm always disappointed with, <laughs> with what comes out of it. I think they're, you know, there's... Mike and Liam are going to be listening intensely they are going to, be to listening. this now. Mike, I'm talking to you when I say this right now. No, there is. There, like, I'm, every time I, sh- like, I shoot a lot of my content out of my Canon. For example, we shot the, the boxing film that we shot. I shot that with the Dynamic Visuals boys. And if you went through that video, could you pick out what was red helium 8K footage and what was 1DX footage? There's no way that you can go through and pick that out because the color, the color profiles are very, very similar between Canon and red. Mm-hmm. Well, probably I would say Canon's closer to RE color style, but you know, similar in a sense. And then just the resolution of Canon's 4K. I don't know what it is about the resolution of Canon's 4K, but it is so, so, so sharp, especially when you pair that with a prime. You put something like a 24 or a 35 or an 85 onto a Canon body, it's just like the footage that comes out of it is phenomenal. That's really interesting. I'm going to have to go look at comparisons yeah, of the 1DS and the red. Go and, go and have a look at that video, and if you can give me a timestamp of what's red Helium 8K footage and what's... Anyone watching this, if you can pick... Well, I'm a complete novice. Like, I, I'm only getting into to video now. and cameras at the moment, but when I get into saying I go deep, and I've been yeah. going deep, and I've been having arguments with Roscoe about, <laughs> like, the Lumi... Because he's, like, a real GH5 guy. If you're purely in video, the only issue with... The only issue with the the micro four-thirds cameras or the APS-C sized cameras is their low light capabilities. Yeah. Are horrible. Yeah. And I just find for too much of what I do, I generally float around ISO 400 to ISO 3200 Mm -hmm. for most of my work because I shoot a lot of weddings, a lot of the sports stuff, a lot of, uh, you know, you just need to have that capability. This goes back to, it, it depends on what you're profiling. 
Mm. And I feel like a lot of those, like guys like Liam and Mike, they're often shooting in the dark. Mm. They're mm. often shooting in volatile environments because they're vlogging. Mm. So I, I get that that's why they go for more of the Sony because the Sony is really good in low light. Mm. I feel like that's yeah. what that's why they go with it. Yeah. It has to be the the defining reason in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree. And they, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say that Canon's better than Sony with low light because it isn't. It's <laughs> well, phenomenal cameras. What we can agree on is they're both better than Nikon. Do you know what's funny now is I see people with Nikon cameras and I think, oh, you poor bastard, you just wasted that money. It is, oh man. I, I mean, look, yeah. at least someone's starting, but um, my partner Lawrence had a Nikon and she hates them. She yeah. absolutely hates them. I, I don't have much experience with them, but from what I've seen, I'll tell you what, I am very curious about the, the new mirrorless Nikon that apparently shoots 6K RAW or shoots RAW video internal uh, because it is way too cheap for what it's offering specs-wise. Mm. Um, I would be very, very, I would be curious enough to buy one and have a look because I feel like there has to be something wrong with it. Yeah. There has to be because it's way too cheap for what it's offering specs-wise. But it piqued my curiosity, which I don't think Nikon's ever done before. Just <laughs> back on the point of um, the artist thing that we were talking about, mm. I remember you said in, um, well, Roscoe asked you, like, um, about your switch to becoming a photographer and how it was sort of left field. But I almost... Mm. And that you were sort of surprised that you succeeded, but I just think that obviously you had a sort of creative background, yeah, and yeah. that was what allowed you to succeed in this new format. Yeah, no, I I I almost started with a little bit of a head start because I was a, a painter and a, a I drew a lot in high school, um, so it was it was almost like my thought process behind it was when I realised that you could be an artist these days with things like social media and YouTube and that sort of thing, I actually gave it a lot of consideration for what I would do. I'm probably the... I'm, it sounds... I, I almost dislike telling this story because I feel like there's a lot of people who are like, oh, you're not an artist from the get-go. You didn't pick up a camera accidentally because your parents gave you one or whatever. It was like... It was a very, very conscious decision for me to start photography. It was a very, like... I'm going to start this with the intention of turning it into my career. Um, but the reason I did that was because I've always been an artist. And the reason I did that was because my thought was, okay, I could get back into drawing and painting, but it's so time consuming. It is not as uh, organic. It's not as, you know, easy to, to sort of succeed. I'm not going to say it's easy to succeed in this, but... Being a, a painter and a drawer, I feel like v limited what I wanted to do. Um, whereas photography made a lot of sense in that sense. I was, wasn't pretending for a minute that I was going to jump in and it was going to work straight away. But it was a very conscious decision to pick up a camera. Mm. It wasn't like a, it wasn't a, uh, like a decision that I was like, oh, let's give this a shot. It was kind of like, okay, let's, let's, I reckon I could do this. And you think it was really Peter McKinnon that sort of... I gave you was, that. It, it was like, do you think that was, that, that, that was the, the aha conference. moment? It was the aha moment. It yeah. was Peter McKinnon that made me realise that I could have a career as an artist. I don't think it was Peter McKinnon that made me realise I could have a career as a photographer. I think it was Peter McKinnon that made me go, ah, oh, this is possible, which yeah. I think is, is a moment that it, it was kind of like everything colliding at once. It's like, like I said, I went through a life where I wanted to be an athlete or I wanted to be a coach or I wanted to do something in sports and athletics. Um, and I think, you know, that early childhood chip on my shoulder combined with falling out of love with fitness and sports, combined with seeing that at the same time, combined with all the times that all of my family have gone, you need to be an artist. It just all came together at one moment and that was that moment. I think his video was kind of the the tip of the iceberg that sort of sunk the Titanic <laughs> in a way. Like it, it was kind of, uh, it was that moment that I was like, okay, let's give this a shot. Yeah. Um, because my entire life before that, every time someone was like, oh, you should do this, you should do that. And I was like, how? And like, you're going to sit there and tell me that I can make a life as a creator? I can make a life as a painter? Fuck off. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So, yeah. So... so I've got to ask, just before we're talking about gear, mm. what does the perfect pack look like for you 
today? <sighs> it depends what I'm. Like I'm, I'm doing so many. Let's say, so let's many say wedding facets. versus uh, branded versus your own content. Okay, so my own content, I would say that the what I have right now is the perfect setup for me. Minus maybe throw a sixteen to thirty five on there rather than a twenty four to seventy. I just love the One DX so much for what I'm doing right now because I can, you know produce those vlog style videos that are sort of scrappy and thrown together. But I can also turn it on and make something that looks like it's shot by a professional video camera. My perfect stuff for branded content, I want a red so badly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, like I've shot on them a few times. I've done hours and hours of research. I've have just, you Have you ever considered building a rig with like a C200? Instead. I have, but I feel like I would be skipping out on a lot. It's like a C200, Canon, like, Canon leads it in the middle tier professional video world. Mm -hmm. It's like Sony's, oh, Sony's SS, SF, SF7, SF5, or I don't know. I don't know what it is. But um, like Canon does really, really well with their C500, their C100 Mark III even, or the C200. Um, but... There's just a few things that aren't <laughs> quite there. Um, you know, the codec is ridiculous. Everyone complains about the raw light codec for Canon. Uh, like shooting on red, there's just something about that look that is just something else. There's something about that look that is something else. So for branded content, I would say a red. And then I think for weddings, I would actually say the 1DX is is the perfect setup for that because it has, you know, it's one of the only cameras that does 4K60 really, really well in a DSLR or mirrorless camera, um, or at least in my opinion. I'm sure there's people that are going to be like, fuck you. No, it doesn't. Like, But at least in my opinion, it's it's also very, very easy to use in the sense that, you know, if I wanted to, I could shoot a wedding photo and video with one camera and I can trust it, which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Like all the times that I shoot with my mates shooting on Sony, there's always like, they're always just a little bit slower to do everything. It's like whenever I'm shooting with them and I'm like, oh, did you shoot video and photo at the same time? And they're like, no, I was focusing on video. And I was like, why couldn't you just smack it across and whatever? Whereas it's literally one switch between me shooting video and photo on yeah. the Canon, which I think is, is cool. Um, so I would actually say for two out of those three things, it would be uh, the One DX with a 16 to 35 and maybe a prime. And then for my, I, I mean, everyone's got their dream ridiculous setup, but I would say probably the red, I mean, I can say the red Monstro, but probably the red Gemini 5K with a... Uh, How would you rig it up? I would rig it with a, a uh, what's the... Like, do you like a handheld rig, or would you basically try? I love a handheld tri rig. Yeah. yeah, I love a handheld rig. Because um, we've been looking at getting the Sony A7 Mark III and having a sort of quasi handheld rig, so like a half mm. cage with the monitor and all that sort of stuff, and the yeah. not the the manual focus, the the tilt to nano thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the the red is like a totally another level. The red is just a different different level. It's also like. It creates a different style of filmmaker in you. I think there's such a... I, I love it. I actually really do love it. I think there's a lot of people that don't love it and there's a lot of traditionist, traditional filmmakers that don't love it. But that style of Sony filmmaking, and I'm going to call it Sony filmmaking because Sony's are the only camera you can do it on where it's shot handheld, but it looks like it's shot on a camera robot. It's like that fast movement, like yeah. everything's shot to lead into the next scene. It's like you see those behind-the-scenes stuff that Daniel Schiffer does or or Peter Lindgren does, um, where everything is handheld, but everything looks like it's so fluid and so nice. You can't do that on a red. Like, you <laughs> really can't do that. Everything needs to be, everything you shoot needs to be thought out, decided. It's completely manual. Nothing that happens on that camera is automatic. So everything that you do needs to be thought out and controlled. And the only way, like, I think it's really, really cool what they're doing, but I think it's just as important to have that, you know, very traditional style mm. filled, like nailed in. Because it's like, how many times, besides when you use a camera robot, for example, it's like, how many times do you watch a movie? Actually, yeah, for anyone listening, it's like, watch a movie. It's like 90% of the shots in the movie are either locked off shots or sliders. Yeah. That's it. Like, that is 
the majority of shots on even the biggest, craziest movies. Like even if you look at the completely visual effects movies, like something like The Avengers, even the VFX shots that are literally like could be anything. They ha have complete control over however they want it to be shot or however they want it to look. Even those movies still just use locked off or sliders, mm. which I think is it. It shows that you know. One story is everything, but two, it's important to have that in your arsenal. Have an ability to tell a story with... Someone that does it really, really well is Matt Diavella. It's yeah. like if you watch his videos, a lot of them are him filming himself and a lot of it is just very thought out, methodical, locked off shots, mm -hmm. which I think is really, really cool. Do you, do you use, um, you know, drone and gimbal? What are you using there, if at all? So I use a Ronin S and drones, I'm sort of moving... I don't know. I don't know what it is about drones but i really love them for photo but i i will use them very sparingly for video i think it's like why is that i don't, I don't know i think i i if i had something i can inspire or I, I don't know i'm just such a sucker for high quality content yeah like i really love well produced content i think a drone one it slows me down like if i was for example you know maybe I'll shoot like a one shot that adds a little bit of context, but I would rather shoot something that's showing, like I would rather shoot it handheld and capture a lot more in that time that I would take the drone out, get it up in the air, get someone to film whilst I'm doing something. It's like, there's just, I don't know, I like drones, but I don't love them right now. I think, I think. <laughs> They've yeah, got a know. long ways to go. They've got a long way to go. But also, I mean, they're just, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I've, I've recently stopped using my drone as much as I used to. Mm. I used to. And I think every filmmaker goes through this. It's like early on, it's very gimmicky. Early on, you're like, everything you do is very like uh, following trends. And it's why go back to any filmmaker's first few videos and they'll be trying to slapstick transitions and all that sort of stuff into their videos. The best bits they looks, like from others. Yeah, they pick things from other people, whereas... Later down the line, um, everything becomes very uni unique to, not necessarily unique, nothing's really unique, but they pick the things that they really, really like from a lot of different areas and then combine that into what's their own style, mm. um, which I think is a really cool moment to get to because uh, it sort of allows you to create a unified body of work that, you know, regardless of, for example, like, you know, you could go and watch one of my videos on my rowing videos and then go and watch the Dubai video that I'm about to release and you'll probably think that they look visually the same mm -hmm. even though they're completely different videos. They're made completely differently. They're made on two completely different topics. They visually follow the same principles, which I think is cool. I, th I think it's cool that you can achieve that at some point is have a, uh, a body of work that stands on its own. Mm. So, and also unified by a theme rather than, you know, literally what you're shooting. It's an interesting thing about um, Tom Nosky, the brand, in it's a bit uh, of a, after watching, like, your video about when you did, I think it's it was... A bit of a, it's a bit of a jerry-rigged brand at the moment, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> the video was, um, I, think, I think it was your then and now video from 2018. Yes. And it was looking at to 2019, which we'll get into in a bit. Mm. But I guess, I mean, you do weddings, you've got your presets and your LUTs, mm. um, and you do branded content. How do you think about, how are you thinking about it today? Who is Tom Nosky, the brand, and what does the next year next look like in too. particular? I, yeah, it's kind of a, I'm kind of going through right now, really questioning that, because I don't think I've had I really don't think I've had a message or a brand message that has unified what I do. Um, so that's something that I'm going through right now. And I don't think it's any different to then and now is probably one of the videos that I've made that I still very much believe in everything I said in that. Mm. Um, because it's so, I kind of, I wish I had a just called it my manifesto rather than following the trend of this is my 2018 video. Like I wish I had a just called it this is me or this is where I'm at or whatever because uh, like right now I'm, I'm going through a period of time where I've got my Instagram which is 
very much dominated by, you know, that ethereal sort of content and doesn't really represent me a whole lot. And then I've got my YouTube channel, which is a split between tutorials and then telling stories. And then I've got my, my business, which is, you know, in a sense, you can nail it down to documentary filmmaking. Yeah. It's weddings and sports films and, and everything in between. Um, and I would love to have them all unified. And I think next year I want to, or next year, the next few years or from now on, I want to sort of focus on um, telling stories is probably the, the one thing that's going to unify a lot of my work because I, I want to start to, like, the way my mind works, I think, and I've always noticed this even when I was younger, is like, I'm often talking to myself. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it is. What, about, in your like, head? Or? In my head or yeah. both or however. Like I'm often constructing stories, telling things to myself, talking to myself or having me talk at me, which I think is – and I'm also just – everything moves really, really quickly. Without fail, you know, 90% of my nights end by me getting into bed, laying down, an idea comes to mind and I get up and I write it down. It's like if you ask my girlfriend, she'll be like, okay, that's what he's doing at 11 <laughs> o'clock at night when he gets up and goes to the end of the bed. It's like I, I just, it's always been in my mind and I kind of want to start to share that a little bit more and I have started a little bit more on my YouTube channel, like my videos um, where uh, I think it's uh, – for like the video for a week I did everything I've been putting off mm. um, that video was very much getting something out of my head <laughs> so like and I really really enjoyed that and I loved the idea that I watched that video again now and I'm like I'm really stoked with how that is regardless of the result which I which whereas with something like uh, my Instagram page right now there was a point where everything I was putting out I was so happy with and it was content that I was excited to share with the world but I think that was just as much fueled by the success it was gaining as much as it was the content that I was creating whereas I think right now I would much rather put out content that I love to look at or love to watch than content that's going to be successful on the platform because I think that creates longevity mm. um, so right I'd now agree, I'd agree with that yeah so right now I'm sort of focusing on sort of I think next year is just going to be or the next few years are just going to be telling stories and and sharing more of what makes me tick because I have I've I feel like I've lived two completely separate lives and now I'm living a couple lives kind of micro lives within this one creative life and I would love to just bring them together I have I I feel like I have you know a lot to share um in a lot of different fields, but mostly in, you know, I, I enjoy I enjoy what I get to do and I hope that everyone else can enjoy doing something. And, you know, the conversations that I have at parties, I'm, I'm very much the kind of person that, oh, Tom's off chatting to someone again, like Tom's off telling stories to this person again. Like, you know, I'm very much that type of person that just, you know, I will sit down with someone and have a conversation with someone about literally anything, regardless of you know whether I know them or regardless of whether it was prompted or not, um, and I would love to translate that into into the work into do. the work that I'm doing. So I think I think it's going to start like I've got a few documentaries that I want to shoot next year, which I think will will very much be the first thing that combines all three, because mm -hmm. I will share snippets of each story via every single facet of my creative world I will try to you know promote the documentaries as much as I can to hopefully have them be successful business wise I will share the documentaries on my YouTube channel to hopefully inspire and teach and whatnot and then I'll also share them as beautiful pieces of art on my Instagram page which I think will be the first time that I've actually done that all together so how do you how are you thinking about or how have you always thought about Instagram, I know you jumped on TikTok recently. <laughs> um, and YouTube filtering into promoting the brand of Tom. I like Instagram. Like, I, I do like Instagram. I think the moment you hold too much weight on one platform is the moment that you begin to lose. I think that's why I've 
jumped on TikTok. It's it's why I've done what I do is because I, I, you know, I I don't really like. There's no one platform that I'm like, this is my favorite. Or, no, and you can't. What I love, and you can't. Yeah. You can't yeah. at all because that's you know, like I I I love Instagram because it's in some way, shape, or form allowed me to do or give me the confidence to do what I am today. Like. I don't necessarily make a living from Instagram, but it was Instagram that gave me the idea. It's like, okay, this is, you know, we're gaining a little bit of momentum here. Like there's people who actually like my work. Um, so that, I, I love Instagram for that reason. But I think that you just need to approach everything from a sense of why is my work, you know, just share your work in whatever nature that comes. If you're a better video creator, then jump on YouTube. Yeah. If you're a brilliant photographer, then jump on Instagram. If you're really good at short form comedy, jump on TikTok. Like, it's just, like, it's not, yeah, like, I, I don't know. I don't really have, give much thought to the actual platform as much as I give thought to the way people use it. Mm. Um, you know, and then there's different ways that you use it. Someone like Mike, Liam and Hayden, those boys, what they do really, really well is is making people love them as much as they love the content they're creating. Yeah. It's like they can post pretty much everything, anything they want and people will love it because they love them. Yeah. Whereas someone like me, you know, I've built an audience on my work. So now it's a transition between trying to get more of that. Yeah. So there's, I don't know. That's I, an interesting like, observation actually because yeah. I was thinking like what is your style and it seems that with your background as a, um, having come from an artistic background and the way that you speak about cameras and and grading and all mm. that sort of stuff that um, you can... And, you know, we were just chatting before about the Joker. Mm. You can really distinguish the differences and that's where the thing... You look for, like, sort of beauty and minutiae, if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. Um, like, I remember calling Hayden who laugh at this, like, I call him Mr. Bombastic because, like, they just... They are... They're, they're like... Not reality TV characters, but they are characters. They if are you know huge what I mean. characters, and I, and I think that's important as well. Is and they've learned to do that as well. Yeah, they've learned to do that, but there's a piece of that in you from day one. It's like if you listen to Hayden's story about when he was in high school, him wanting to be the most popular kid, him wanting to, you know, get everyone's attention. Uh, in that sense, like you realise that okay, Hayden's been Hayden since day one. And I think that's super important as well because I think a lot of people see that and they're like, okay, this is the only way to succeed. Whereas, like, I realised very, very early on that I'm not that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just not, that's not me. I, I really appreciate that and I think it's amazing that they've been able to do that. But that's not me. So it's... It's good to know that. Yeah, it's good to... It's good. It's really good to know that. It's Because a lot of people try and be saying that they're not, like... And that's exhausting. Yeah. Like, I, exhausting. I've thought about um, in the new year, obviously, when we get this rig as well, we'll be starting my own YouTube channel to talk about things. And I was like, what is it that we do well? And, and you just... You can't go to a channel and say, I want to be like that channel, but, yeah. but me... You need to come up with a unique thing. Otherwise, yeah. you're not going to flourish well on the platform either. You're also just not going to create content that you like that you like or you're not going to continue to create content it's like I, I think Hayden said it if he didn't say it on your podcast he said it on another podcast he did and I love his way of interpreting it um, it's the idea that the the quote uh, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life is bullshit yeah and I think he he was the first person that sort of I always realized it but I never put it into words he was the first person that was like, no, that's bullshit. Of course you're going to have hard days. Like, you're yeah. going to wake up some days. I've, for the last three weeks, I've woken up and just like nothing is coming out of me on YouTube, which is why I've sort of really want to create something that I'm passionate about, which is why I want to make videos about the things that I do. You know, why am I going to parties and why would I rather sit in the corner and have a chat to someone than party? That's probably because I really enjoy that. Mm. So why can't I turn that into something that, I do. You could, on YouTube. but you could also talk about the fact of why why you've been struggling. I remember um, Hayden did like a mini video about that recently. Yeah, um, and not enough people talk about that. But I feel like if you do it, it sort of releases the shackles anyway. Yeah, it does, and you've sort of got to. Yeah, like what he he mentioned to me was like there are going to be days where you wake up and you're not going to enjoy 
the thing that you love the most. Yeah, like, there are days which is that, tough. Which is tough. There are going to be days where it's just not going to happen. Like, and if you can create content that you love to create because it's you then it's going to be so much easier even on those hard days. And then on the best days, you're going to be maximizing your ability to, to do that sort of thing. And I think that's what they do so well is because they love making videos together. Yeah. They really, really enjoy the process. So, you know, for them to make a video, it's not a case of sitting down and be like, okay, we need to make a video today. It's like, oh, hell, we're going for a shoot this afternoon. All right, let's make a video. Yeah. Like, it, it's a lot of fun for them to do that, and I think that's, that's something that... It's such a saturated market, so of course it's going to happen. Like, everyone starting out looks at the successful people, but by the time that you are that successful, then that would have changed anyway, so there's no point in you following... Like, if I go out tomorrow and I'm like, I'm going to copy Hayden to a T, and I'm going to do everything that he does... By the time that I get to that, even if it does by an absolute miracle and faking it till I make it, even if I do get as successful as Hayden does, once I get to that point, the trend's going to change. What's mm. successful is going to change. So there's no point in me doing yeah. that anyway. You need to blend what, what you like, what you do well with what you think people will like. It's a tough thing to do. It is hard. You're just going to be continually putting stuff out. It is hard because, that. yeah, it's, it's combining... Yeah, and I I hate sounding like, oh, you got to just focus on what you love and artsy-fartsy. <laughs> and, and that is being an artist in the truest sense of the word. It's like, I want to do what I enjoy. But you also need to do what is going to do well, in a sense. Like, there is an element of playing the game. There mm. is definitely an element of playing the game where, you know, if you're... A lot of my musician friends struggle with this, and I think musicians are the the realest type of artists. If, if there was, you know, one type of artist that is the pinnacle of what it means to be an artist, I think musicians are because they really struggle with... Like, I have a lot of my artist friends that I'll, I'll see who I haven't seen in a while and they'll come to me and be like, oh, I'm going to put out a, an EP. I'm, I'm gonna, and I'm like, okay, well, are you going to put it out? And they're like, oh, no, no, I want to make sure my marketing is, is down to a T oh, and I want to make sure everything that. is lined up and I want to make sure everything's good. And I'm like, who are you marketing to? Yeah. It's like you don't have an audience. And they're like, oh, well, I, like, I want to make sure like when I release it, a lot of people see it. It's like no one's going to see it because you don't have an audience because you haven't put out any music. Like there's an element of you have to do something enough so that you can realize whether it's successful or not. Yeah, well, that it's funny you mentioned that because that sounds like, um, you know, we had a few questions. Mind you, we noticed there's so much more spam now that these, these mass-looking services... So, like, there's people that are obviously operating on behalf of a blue tick somewhere mm. and they just go and comment, like, a love heart or, a, like, hi, Uncommon Show, we'd love to work with... Like, it's so fucking strange. There is a lot of... Yeah, I've, I've realised that recently. There's a lot of... I've been getting views. I think this is something a lot of people are noticing. I've getting views on my stories from, like, big names. Um, but it's just it's someone obviously not operating. them. It's just a bot operating their account viewing a lot of stories so i will notice that and then go and follow their account exactly which i think is yeah it's terrible but so bad the questions we had and it has happened through all of the episodes we've done with you hayden mike and liam is people asking questions around uh what type of camera kit would you buy for three grand or uh, what yeah. would you do yeah. for a thousand like all these questions and basically they are they are a means of procrastination to stop them actually just going out and doing something. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to answer it better than Mark did on this podcast because he answered it perfectly. But um, I think that, well, yeah, to say what Mark said, it's like you just need to start. Yeah. Like, like I think... Go listen to the first th podcast episode we did. Go Anyone look, listen to this? Go first YouTube video. It's yeah, horrible. It's, it's like, horrible. Yeah, you just need to start because it's... Like, I don't think... I, I think I made, like, 35 videos before I even had lights. <laughs> like, it's... You need to... You really need to just start because it's, like... For example, right now, I'm... You know, my focus right now with my YouTube channel, or at least the focus for this year was, I'm going to make as many videos as possible and I'm just going to completely ignore the analytics or the stats because I think that what that made me achieve is... I'm now better at creating videos and I'm not successful yet. So I've had an opportunity to really look at my body of work and really look at what I'm creating and look at it 
analytically now because I've now made well over 100 videos in my... In, I, I think I've made like... I think I've made 90 YouTube videos this year. Right. Which is a fuckload of videos, it's especially considering I didn't start making them until like June. So I've like in the last six months, I've made like 80 odd video, 80, 90 odd videos. But that now allows me to, I'm almost glad that none of them popped off and none of them built an audience because now I can go and be like, okay, now yeah. I am proficient at this now i know what i'm doing now i know how to talk to the camera now i know what i'm doing yeah let's actually go on and have a good crack at this it's funny you mention that because i was having a conversation with um the guys from the daily talk show and um i actually went for a big fucking walk um with one of the hosts there and we we're talking about how like podcasters who have had great success mm. and when they have that success what often happens over time is that people will get sour on them because they haven't perfected their craft. Mm. And yeah, we were talking about a, an example and it was super interesting how when you blow up initially that really can impact you. Whereas if you Damage spent you. the year or two really getting your craft right, then when people eventually find you, yeah. um, you're there. F I don't know, You just it sort of comes across better. I don't know. And people will notice that effort in those first videos. Yeah, the faster you rise, the faster you rise, the faster you fall. Yeah. It's 100% true because if I had, for example, you know, I, I love teaching, but I don't love making tutorials. I think I enjoy making tutorials and I love teaching people things, but I don't love watching my tutorials. Like I don't finish editing a tutorial and I watch it over and I'm like, that was sick. Like, I really like that. And I love to love to watch my videos. Like, when I watched the boxing video I made for my mate, I watched that, like, two dozen times <laughs> in, like, a day. When I finished it, I was like, this is sick. I love this. I was so excited to post it. Like, even my Dubai video I've made now, I'm so happy with it. And I love it. And some of the videos that I put out that are more storytelling and having a conversation with the camera, I love to watch those because I love to watch them back. I'm like, I really got my point across there. I really love watching that. Whereas I make my tutorials and like, I admit they're good content, they're valuable, people are going to enjoy them and they do better on my channel. But I'm so stoked that none of them popped off because if it had, a, you know, say for example, if one of them got a million views and it gained me 50,000 subscribers, well shit, now I'm pitching now people, and now there's yeah. 50,000 people that don't care about the fact that I don't like making tutorials. They yeah. want to see tutorials. That, that's all they want to see. Yeah. Um, we're hitting on time, so I want to, and I need a piss. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump into some rapid fire questions. Go for it. Uh, we've got three for you. Mm. Uh, first one is what does your morning and evening routine look like? My morning routine is pretty bare bones. I like my pot of French press coffee and I drink a litre of water first thing in the morning. Damn. Yeah, so I have my cup. Uh, it's probably probably similar to this. It's like a shaker cup. Yep. Um, and I finish two of those before, usually before 9 a.m. Okay. Wow. Which I've done. I don't think I've... Like, I feel worse when I miss that than when I miss my coffee. Wow. Yeah. And so evening, what do you do to decompress? That's probably something I, I really struggle with. I think I just jump on... Um, I really shouldn't. I should start... But who cares? I enjoy it. I jump on YouTube and just Fuck, watch mate. my... I just binge a couple, like, two or three videos that I are love just it. my... You know, and people completely unrelated to my thing. Like, right now, I'm really enjoying Nick Bear. Okay. Like, I've got some ambitions to do... Uh, it's always been a huge bucket list item for me to do an Ironman, like an Ironman triathlon. Um, and he recently went from sort of a very bodybuilder to finishing an Ironman in a very competitive time. So I'm really enjoying his channel at the moment. And then I have a bunch of others that are just completely unrelated. I really enjoy Star Wars Theory. <laughs> so I watch his videos. Um, and then a couple of other guys that I just, at the end of the night, when I'm completely done work and when George is heading off the bed, I'll just jump on my phone and watch two or three videos that are just completely unrelated. Let me zone out and just enjoy whatever for a bit. Best purchase under $200. Best purchase under $200. Holy hell. Um... Probably my Wacom Intuos tablet that I use to draw. Uh -huh. So I use that to draw in my own time. So I doodle on a computer and then also um, using it to add like a very um, organic touch to my images. So I actually wow. go in and usually paint highlights back and that sort of stuff on my photos. Wow. Yeah, so that's, that only cost me 105 bucks. So, Jesus. So that was, that's probably 
been the one purchase that has made the biggest difference. Last one for you. If you, it's Christmas in about a week or so. If you had to gift a book to the audience, one book, what would it be and why? It would be Think and Grow Rich by, I can't remember the guy who wrote it. It was an old, old book. I think you can actually get it for free now. So I think it's technically considered, uh, I think it's been reconsidered as a, a, a textbook. So I think it's online as a PDF for free. Wow. Like it's just a web page that has the book as a PDF. Um, you right. can grow rich or... Uh, Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Or, yeah, I've heard this one repeatedly. Or uh, there's another one that I think they go together really, really well, Think and Grow Rich or um, Extreme Ownership by Jocko ah, yeah. Willing. Jocko Willing. That's yeah. a really, really good book on on just owning your shit. It's like no responsibility, one else responsible. responsibility, leadership. Yeah, yeah. I love it's like it. like no one's responsible for you except for you, which I really, really like because I think that's a there's a lot of blame going on in today's society, which I think yeah. is so detrimental to not only the people giving the blame but the people receiving the blame and... I, I I think that's something my parents did really really well. Is I was responsible for all my screw ups. I was responsible for everything I did. It's like yeah. they made sure I knew that you know. And then also learning all through my life. It's like I am the only person that can change any of my circumstances. Yeah, it's a decision. It's like if I want to be happy, I'm going to be happy. If I want to be sad, I'm going to be sad. I would say that that book and and also um, I'm actually giving this book to my mum for Christmas, which will be funny, but. Uh, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson was similar. I haven't read that, similar, but I love Jordan Peterson. Similar responsibility, taking ownership. And, um, yeah, like a, not enough people are given that um, life lesson or, or told that they need to take responsibility, and responsibility is the greatest thing you can do. 100%. Um, operating under duress is the best thing, I find. Yeah, well, pressure grows diamonds. Yeah. Like it, it's 100, <laughs> that's 100% true with life. It's like... The, I think the the best thing that I did this year was move out of home with no, uh, not really any financial position to do so. Yeah. It's like I was starting, I was still in the first 12 months of starting my business when I moved out, sorry, just over the first 12 months and I was, you know, one month earning more money than I've ever seen and then some months earning nothing. Like it was very unpredictable and I stepped into a position where I had to, you know, everything, like I had an extra... Fifteen hundred dollars a month that needed to be paid for on top of everything else. So, yeah, I, like, and in that pressure, it has created a lot of what makes me financially more free. I'm not financially free, no way. Twenty two, but I'm far more financially capable right now because of that decision to just throw myself in the deep end. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I think that having something like that will make you just go hard. Yeah, it's also like a lot of like I. I came back from when I quit my job I went and lived in Canada for a few months and then I came back with close to no savings like I spent all my savings in in Canada I spent way too much money (laughs) Um, and I just came back and I decided that I didn't want to get a job I just did not want a job so I it was a it was hard in the beginning it was really really hard in the beginning it was uh, the cause of a lot of my anxiety was the fact that I just didn't have any money um (laughs) but now because of that I'm not you know I I don't know maybe I would have been better off if I had a job because I would have been able to afford certain things that I wasn't able to afford maybe I'd be further along but right now I feel like I'm in the a better position than I would have been if I had have gone and gotten a part-time job and and tried to do that Mm. So, Tom, it's been a pleasure having you on, mate. It's been a, it's been a good conversation. It's um, been different. I think half yeah. of it was a financial podcast, which <laughs> is interesting. Was. No, it's good. I think um, it's just a different angle that people get to see you. Yeah. Um, if you want people to find you on the interwebs, where are the best places for you? So Instagram... I'm not going to say Facebook because Facebook's not a thing. Instagram, <laughs> uh, YouTube, and if you really want to have a laugh, head over to TikTok. Yeah, <laughs> TikTok's gold. I've had some yeah. videos in there with like 40,000 views. I still can't get over it's it. It's so funny because my only video that's ever gone viral was just a video of me driving through the bush uh, and it was an iguana on the road. And I've just rolled down the window. I've got my phone and I've gone, Oi, mate! Get out of the way. And then <laughs> that's the video. It's like five seconds of me yelling at an iguana. And it's the most Australian thing you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. And it went 
just went off. That's fucking gold. It is a funny video. If you're on TikTok, <laughs> go check it out. Yeah. Um, but Tom, thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you so much for watching Uncommon and this week's episode. If you like it, smash that like button. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, please do subscribe. We would love that. We'd love to build this audience that we're growing here of Uncommoners. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with audio, you can search for us on all of your good podcast apps. It's Uncommon or Uncommon Show. We'll typically find us. For social, you want to see behind the scenes this amazing studio that I'm sitting in, just search at Uncommon underscore show uh, and everything will be there, including our weekly promos. But um, look, thanks so much for stopping by. Until next time, thanks for watching.